It's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Mason. Uh, Sculpture's excited to have her here with us for the past couple of days and next couple of days. Rachel is an artist, musician, and filmmaker from Los Angeles. Mason has recorded 13 albums, has toured and exhibited sculpture, video, and performance at the Whitney Museum, Queens Museum, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Detroit Museum of Contemporary Art, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and many others. She has been reviewed by the New York Times, Village Voice, Los Angeles Times, Flash Art, Art in America, Art News, and Art Forum. Her album and feature film, The Lives of Hamilton Fish, was released in 2016 and has toured festivals and museums internationally and nationally. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Mason. Hi. Oh my God, I hate my, when my resume gets read just because I'm like, did I write that in this weird, no. Anyway, thank you. Um, that's cool. Uh, basically, I wanted to sh throw together a bunch of different things, um, some of which are pieces that I did when I was at school, because I think it's a neat thing to see somebody's path. And I'm going all the way up to my most current project, which is a, um, it's actually a documentary. It's not even in the art world at all. It's in the film world, and uh, I'm premiering it at the Tribeca Film Festival. And I, I kind of show what I do as a way for you to all kind of see different paths that you can wind up in as an artist. I've wound up in a lot of different places. And um, so I know Rebecca from UCLA, my back in the day. Um, and I'll show some work from, from that time. So this is a piece that I did uh, when I was at Yale. And um, another thing I think I might mention is just that I now see a kind of th uh, a through line in my own work that relates to American politics and our sort of trajectory and history. And this piece I did, um, it's actually a portrait study of all of the different heads of state from every single country that's recognized in the, in the CIA's World Factbook or kind of the UN. So. Um, the kind of officially recognized countries. And I was kind of aware in 2004 when the Bush presidency befell us that um, you know, I really didn't know enough about the world, I still don't, and politics, and it was just suddenly like, ah, the political realities of who are these people I don't know anything about and they're gonna just destroy the world right now. And um, you know, in being, thoughtful about what was going on in uh, 2004. So I showed this piece at Yale on the day that the United States invaded Iraq. And I remember having a critique that just like sounded like voices talking and I couldn't hear anything because I was so in a world of panic as rightfully I think we all should have been at that moment about what was gonna happen. And um, I was realizing the weird connection between this piece and my own sense of being an artist, like needing desperately to look at the faces of all of the different people who rule the world in some way, you know, small countries, large countries, our country, and just kind of distilling them into this one black and white space. So this was a kind of a wide shot of the way it looks. Um, and it was concurrent with another piece I'll show. Again, very student work, I think, um, when I was at Yale, I made something called the Model Anthem, which is a hybrid of the music and English translated lyrics of 193 national anthems. And that's also the number of countries at that time that was recognized in the UN. And um, I worked with a computer programmer to input all of the English translations of all kinds of, an of all the anthems. And this programmer actually went on to spound Twitter with some people. So he was using the language modeling system that was, um, the basis for um, word probability expectation. And um, so starting with the very first most common anthem word, which is the word O, oh, everything fell from there. And it, it, it ingested all of these anthems. And it was just this crazy string of wild, amazing poetry that was like this conglomeration of what all countries seem to say in their anthems. You know, things like forever the battle against fear arise ye sons of independence against the future generations, like things that were the words of anthems merged together. And because I was at Yale at the time, I, there was a concert band, so I approached them about 
doing it and they did it and then I kind of asked other people to do it and it created kind of a weird spin-off of uh, highbrow, lowbrow, like what happens with music, like an anthem. And then this was another performance, this is just documentation, but um, I had learned about the Attorney General at that time, John Ashcroft, had sung this like god awful insane song called Let the Eagle Soar and I, and I, I found documentation of it and I decided to kind of throw it into some of my sets at different performances just to see how it would land. So again, this is me documenting things. And this was kind of my very major, what's the, the word, tour de force when I like was my, my thesis piece at Yale. Um, and I had this image in a dream actually when I just couldn't get this like image of the Bush era, Bush like administration out of my head. And Yale was this place with lots of white sculptures of the founding fathers everywhere. And, and I found this image of myself like in a dream, like making out with the president. And it was so gross and horrifying. Although weirdly enough, it all just now seems like a different moment. Like, okay, that whole nother moment about thinking about presidents. But um, at that time, I don't know, it just was really strange. So I showed this piece at my thesis, and this can happen to you. I showed it in a little tiny gallery in my friend's um, house, not, not even a gallery, it was his living room. And the New York Times was doing a story about um, artists responding to the Republican National Committee that had come to New York. And this was on the blown up front page New York Times art section, like huge. And I was so like in a funk of depression during that whole era when the you know, Bush administration, just getting out of grad school, all that stuff. I, had, I saw the front page and somebody was on the subway and I was like, God damn it, somebody else made my sculpture. <laughs> like everything's wrong with the world. And then I got out of the, you know, and it's on the New York Times. So I got out of the subway and some, my friend was calling me. I was like, Rachel, your sculpture's on the cover of the New York Times. So. You know, I say this because you just never know what's going to happen with anything you make, ever. So that's how it looked, kind of sitting on a little thing, and that was how it was displayed. And this, I would say, kind of led me into another project f that took quite a few years. This was at the MOCAD, right here in Detroit, um, which is so cool. And so basically throughout, uh, from 2004 till about 2010, this was like my ongoing obsession project and um, it just took me forever and I was basically going through my own life from the time I was born until the time I showed this at MoCAD. That's basically when I stopped working on it, 2010. Um, so I was about 30 and I showed the piece. So it was 30 years of my life as an imaginary ambassador to all of the wars that were like the dominant wars and then also wars that were smaller that we didn't, you know, maybe were sort of regional wars. I was wanting to think about warfare, but in a kind of sort of trope of personality, like who were the political leaders, just who's, you know, maniacal people that like, you know, basically I think it takes a really strange person to become a leader of a country and like although I don't know, right now we're sitting in like the most un unreal time of all time. So, but before that it was also really strange. Um, so, you know, I wanted, I was so fascinated with all these people. And so this is me as an ambassador at the age of like six when um, this is the Falklands War and this is Margaret Thatcher and that is um, Gaddafi and Ronald Reagan. And they're kind of like the players in every war. So it was kind of like a, a dumb version of history distilled into a, a weird kind of China doll set, you know, this sort of like porcelain, it's set. And um, that just is also in a way a critique of our American perspective, a self critique of like, I'm, you know, so ignorant, recognizing that I'm also an artist making art objects and the, the weirdness of political art as a thing, you know, it gets traded in a system that actually often ties back to people in power. So I was sort of thinking about all of this um, and getting these political, this was a war um, between Congo and Burkina Faso. Um, and this is, I displayed it in CUNY in a library. So again, another example of how you can 
a piece that can can morph and be displayed in different ways. Um, and I had this great cabinet maker who was able to do this for me. And I had made also this project spun out into a series of albums and performances. And in this drawer were some of the lyrics that I had written in the imagined minds of some of the different people. So I wrote two albums of music, and I'll get, show some of those later, um, where I would perform in rapid succession costume changes, where I would transform myself in live performances and sing as though I was Saddam Hussein or Mobutu Sese Seko here. Um, and some of the songs I wrote, some of the songs I actually used lyrics from um, people that were involved in the conflicts that I knew personally, or um, in one case, I wrote to Manuel Noriega, the leader of Panama, and he was um, in jail in Miami, and he wrote me back. And this letter exchange with the real Manuel Noriega led to a song that I wrote kind of with him in collaboration. So this was, you know, very obsessive political art, and this was um, another way that it was shown. So it had kind of a cool, like, touring life. And now, oh, this was me performing as Mullah Omar, the one-eyed, um, he, he was, uh, he died a few years ago, one-eyed leader. Um, and then I would do these rapid costume changes, the leader of Burkina Faso. This was all the same. This is kind of a promotional image, um, but you can see some various um, costumes that I would don, and really ranging from, from a whole bunch of different countries. That's, um, that's Mobutu Sese Seko. And this was written by um, a guy who, this was sort of how the albums were displayed, but the song about Mobutu was written by a great um, uh, um, activist in LA, Emery Holmes II, who's also a poet. And Anyway, so some of the lyrics came from different people and I would transcribe them into songs. And it was about like getting into the heads of these really complicated like unbelievably complicated people, you know, with strange, twisted backstories, like Saddam Hussein. Um, and I sang this song from the imagined moment of his execution, um, and quoting lyrics from his own, um, uh, like f he wrote these crazy fantasy novels, actually. And he had this obsession with fantasy imagery. So I really got deep into the worlds that the actual leaders that I could research found themselves in. Um, and this is Fidel Castro, and a friend of mine wrote that song. So this is, I also inserted some of these songs on YouTube as I was just sort of curious to see what things would happen. This song got extremely popular in Chechnya, which I thought was like, kind of scary and crazy and wild, but um, it became you know, a little bit viral, or I don't know what the definition of viral is, but this song is now in rotation on just like tons of different Chechen. Um, to be honest, it's a little bit scary because they're, you know, it's an ongoing conflict, and you know, it was like my taste of getting close to the fire and being like, oh, okay. F stumbled in yet again in this like, you know, I do recognize my like Americanness in this whole thing. Um, I stumbled into a conflict, although I've in, been invited to perform this song at various Chechen uh, concerts, which has been really interesting. Um, this is my song about Manuel Noriega, and I performed it in front of a, um, a video image of um, the canal, the Panama Canal. And when I wrote to him and wrote, he, I had this ear infection. And it was a really crazy thing because in the line in his book, he told me I should read his book and I could quote anything. He wrote about how his canal is infected with the blood of Americans, like really powerful language. And I had this ear infection that was actually like spreading and it was really a dangerous ear infection. So I connected the two and it's called Se Infecto Mi Canal in Spanish. My canal is infected. Uh, this is another kind of weird offbeat piece. I'll show you these two images, but um, this was probably right after I graduated Yale. Again, being in this time of thinking about political dynasties, because of the Bush era, we had had this dynasty, and you know, we could have had another one if Clinton became our president. I was thinking about the kind of strangeness of American relationship to rulers, um, and my sense of like, well, we have this dynasty, we have this kind of political elite. Where does that come from? And um, if you're aware of um, European history, 
the most kind of inbred and like the weirdest like turned inward ruling family were the Habsburgs and they just inbred themselves literally to death and Carlos II was the last of the line and he was just so deeply congenitally mutated with every possible awful thing you could imagine um, that he was the last of the Spanish empire from the Habsburg line which is like that, it, that would be like just America collapsing right now under Trump. Like, boom, it's done. We're no longer, like, the, the, the entirety of this line collapsing in this one person because of the disease of inbreeding was just a, a powerful metaphor to me. And I, I feel, um, you know, so I made this pot, <laughs> a planter, with leaves growing out, and I created a, a sculpture of myself as Carlos II and I also again relate to music and I had written a song as though I was Carlos II and that's kind of where this all came from and then around that time I had done a installation at the Sculpture Center which is a really cool place they have open residencies you guys should all write this down Sculpture Center in practice because it's a great place for after you graduate um, you can apply for their in practice residency and so I was able to kind of carry this idea out because I was selected um, to be in it. And um, basically what I did was I was thinking about how the center of this like deformity in the Habsburgs was the jaw. And I just was thinking about teeth as this kind of really intimate oops, portrait of a person. And I would say that um, things kind of morphed for, for me from this point, um, just in my work, I think I kind of got to the tail end of certain certain ways of thinking about sculpture um, in relation to political figures. And I was thinking about how um, just we are all really genetically connected. And whenever there's you know any kind of um, need to identify a person, they and they can't you know find the body. The teeth are the marker. And so I created this room. It was kind of an homage to the teeth of different friends of mine and like a portrait gallery and set it up like a medieval kind of portrait gallery in this kind of, because I had been to visit the place where the Habsburgs were from and you know, the, or the kind of large dynast, dynastic um, cathedral where Carlos actually lived and died, um, which is called El Escorial and it's the coolest place to write that down. <laughs> if you ever go to Spain, um, it's amazing. Um, but so I was thinking about this empire that we have in this country and this kind of connection and the way that, you know, I, I have my own sort of royal family and, and this is my, like, my connection to the people around me. Um, this, by the way, was a microcosm of the room inside of a sculpture of a friend of mine and all the different sculptures were kind of packed into this room that I created. It's like about this big and miniatures of everything were in there. So you can see. Um, the chessboard, and actually this piece, my friend whose teeth I cast, I had a wonderful dentist who everyone came through, shortly after making this piece, my friend died. And I remember thinking, you know, wow, just what a tribute that this piece was this gift to me. Um, yeah, anyway. So this was another, this is a one-off, not, I think this is a piece that was also kind of an oddball for me. Oops, I was thinking about the kind of weird aspects, again, of, oops, political portraiture. Um, and kind of the most, again, like in thinking about royalty, the kind of weird quasi-royalty that we have in our media landscape and the people that have risen to these moments of fame and power and like, who are they? And they create like deity status and, you know, um, so I created this strange little, um, this kind of mob mobile moving apparatus that uh, was sort of inspired by uh, The Wizard of Oz Part Two. If you ever have seen it, there's this moment where um, the lead character, I forget, she just goes in and has all these heads that she can try on different heads. So I was thinking about that idea of like, wow, if you could try on different heads and have this kind of morphing of worlds. At this moment, the particular people that were constantly in the media for some strange reason were the people that I just thought to include as a kind of royalty. So there was Oprah Winfrey, um, Anne Rand, L. Ron Hubbard, um, 
uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, kind of funny enough. Now this piece seems very dated because of that. And this woman with the, behind L. Ron Hubbard is Lindsay, I forget her name now, but she was in the Abu Ghraib like, torture video where she was torturing soldiers. And, and then um, Kim Jong-il, who was still alive at that time. And it was just this weird mix of people that I felt like were kind of leveled out in the things I was reading. So anyway, that was, I'm going to keep going. OK, so this is, Rebecca saw this show. This was um, at a space that was actually, my parents have had a warehouse in LA. I'll get to this later when you see the documentary. They, they're in a very quirky business that sells gay adult videos. and. Um, so this was where they housed their videos, and my friend John Knuth came in one day. I was like, could we turn this into a gallery and just for just like a few months and do these cool shows? And, you know, I'm always inspired by people that, like, take initiative to just, oh, I have a space. Let's figure this out. You know, that's another lesson to you. Actually, my friend Sharon, who's here, had a house that was like a crazy art house. And um, so uh, this was a little bit of that, but it was a warehouse. And it turned into a really functioning gallery for about two years. And I did this show here where um, I had been invited on the weirdest you know, trajectory. I don't know how it happened, but I got invited by a writer through a friend of a friend who was doing a story about John Edwards, the political candidate who went down in flames a few years back when Obama was running for office in 2009. And I was invited to go on the campaign trail, the actual primary presidential campaign trail. So it was so cool being in like, it's really neat to just get immersed into a totally different world. And the world of like real politicians, I think he, this writer had found me because my work and politics had kind of bubbled to the surface in some way. Like, oh, we need a political artist, here's somebody. So he was like, you know, could you do some sketches of just the different characters on the campaign trail? And I met everybody. I met Obama, Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, all this, you know, other side characters like Mike Gravel, um, the guy from Ohio, what's his name with the K? Anyway. Yeah, Kucinich. Wow. Characters, like real serious characters. Oh my God. And I just realized in this drawing, oh yeah, even like Giuliani, and like they were all just so desperate. I mean, these are all people that wanted to be the president of the United States. And so here I was like, drawing their portrait and like being right up close and and just it was the craziest thing because when you encounter a person that is like at that moment in their lives when they could conceivably achieve this like un unreal thing they're all just like on this like on steroids like a personality on steroids and so I just constantly was around these people in this unbelievable state heightened state and um so I created a show with all the drawings that I was making um, uh, of this whole thing, and, and the Edwards article never came out because he didn't want to grant an interview to Playboy magazine. One why? wonder why, yeah, John Edwards, because <laughs> he had a, a crazy affair going on. It was really uh, bizarre, but so I made this show, and all of these different podiums are actual gestures that the candidates would make like every single one would count at some point, just, okay, there's like things we're gonna count about. And I would start noticing they would just do this without even counting anything. It was just a gesture. And, um, and I wondered if they like went to a certain school of gesturing, like this is a thing, you know, um, holding the podium. So that was this show. Um, yeah, that's Obama, actually. He told me, he thanked me for not making his ears big. That was John Edwards. <laughs> um, and, and then I made some of these that I thought I were like the monsters. They were so like, ah. it was like operatic, their performances. So I'll, sh I'll at the end kind of show videos of these different um, pieces. But so this is one of the first things I did with this character called Future Clown. And this is um, a performance that's really, a. I would say kind of a YouTube performance, but it, it was shown in a gallery. And basically, um, I'd heard about Rand Paul doing a filibuster, and I just, one day, it was like this little clip of it was on the news, and it was so weird and fascinating. If you listen to a filibuster, you, you, I'll show you some of it. It's just, it sounded like absolute 100% nonsense. And I just thought, well, this is the thing that you always hear about. Like, 
the filibuster as the thing that will shut down the government and like put people, you know, to force them to stand for eight hours. And basically it's kind of like a Gertrude Stein novel. They just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the same kind of posturing of an idea. Um, so I decided as like an endurance test that I would do this and film it as um, in my character, Future Clown, which I had been actually doing a lot of different things in. So Future Clown was kind of like this internet avatar character. Oh yeah, this is me visiting the Senate. Amazingly, I was uh, teaching at the Corcoran and one of the students was like, you know, you could do your future clown thing, I'll take you to the Senate. And I was like, really, I, in a clown suit? And he was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I rolled into the Senate, like the actual Senate, I didn't even have my ID. I don't know how this country operates. It was so bizarre, but I was like, all right. Walked in, walked all around the chambers. I mean, there were like secret service people there, but I, I fully looked like future clown. And there's Senator Gillibrand's office. Anyway. So that was fun. Oh, this is, you know, there's like the little security guard behind me and, you know, some other political operative. Yeah, and then this is um, another just variation on performances. So I'm, I'm kind of cutting out as I've gone through like my big political art works that took dominated chunks of time for me. In the meantime, as an artist, performance artist, um, I've done just lots of pieces that existed in different landscapes. And this was part of a, um, a project that um, I did at Joshua Tree. I filmed Future Clown kind of walking into this landscape. And um, I had heard about, I mean, for me, Future Clown is both a character that is, you know, the, the history of clowns and clowning across all cultures is actually one of a character that is both sacred and profane and kind of allows you to like question authority everywhere, but also a character that exists in order to question all reality. And um, it's really a universal thing if you kind of look up sacred clowns or clowning in general. Um, clowns are just this sort of shamanic figure. So I had read about um, this really strange, or it's a forest in Japan where people commit suicide. And they would go into this forest and try to find bodies, and I was, it was a documentary, and the guy would look for these strands and follow the strand, and if the person was there at the end, it would, well, they obviously were dead, but if they, was, if they weren't there at the end of that strand, it had meant they changed their mind and left, and I was so sort of struck by this, like, just kind of image of man entering nature, humankind entering nature, with this, like, thread of our, you know, very slight connection to life and death. And what is that thing? And you, you might be like desperately trying to find somebody and that person might be finding you. And, and if for whatever circumstances it works out or it doesn't work out, it really is life and death on two ends of this. So for me, when I had watched this, you know, I get things in my head just with the future clown character. I was like, wow, future clown really needs to do this. So I, I did this as part of a video performance piece. Um, and that was shown in a gallery, shown, or actually not shown in a gallery, just shown in different performance spaces, places like HM 157, which Sharon, who's here, ran. And this was a place in New York called Silent Barn. Um, and then these are also kind of s a s sculptures that I created um, basically for an imaginary set of a uh, of a rock opera musical that I had floating around in my head, um, a kind of like futuristic world. And um, basically, I did these pieces. Oh, gosh, my work is so all over the place sometimes. I did these pieces when I was at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council LMCC residency. And in a way, I would say these were transitional pieces for me because I feel like I moved I allowed myself the freedom to move out of like hardcore figurative sculpture, political, like making a point. And it just, that whole work was starting to make me crazy. And I needed to go into a more freeing place. And I think that was also this transition with Future Clown, that character was I started to do more projects that were kind of more wide, wide thinking. Um, so I'll just fly through some of these things. So these are, oh, well, 
actually here, this, this piece here was part of a video with Future Clown and I interviewed people and asked them about dreams and I would sort of envision the dream scenario within the set that I used those props that you just saw. So this was um, a set. And if you see in the middle, I have these dolls hanging here. And again, I think this is where it's cool to show things like this in a school because sometimes you're, I don't know why I'm making dolls right now, but I have to do that. And then like, I don't know why I'm making this like paper mache hat, but then, you know, the, oh wait, those are two projects and like, I'm gonna go here next year and this I'm gonna finish up right now. So, um, you know, you never quite know where you're going with certain pieces, but um, so that thing that I had right here is a, a portrait of artists, women artists that had really inspired me. And I don't know if it was, you know, this definitely was pre-Trump era, but I think somehow I felt some need in my life or for like female strength and also just witnessing and feeling this weight of um, the artists that were my heroes. I mean, I think, you know, a little side note to all the students here is that it's, it's hard to be an artist. You know, you do it for a while and like, it's just a very challenging path. And, um, you know, maybe for some people it's not. Some people it's like super easy home run. Uh, but, you know, if you are, I think, traversing different things like performance, sculpture, it can, you know, it can just be a hard path. And um, one of the artists that I worked for, I had the great honor, really, of working for Joan Jonas, who was one of my heroes in art. And I just remember when I was her assistant, having this feeling of like, wow, you figured this out. Like, I know it wasn't easy, but you're 70 and you stuck with this and like, you could do this. You know, I just, you know, you got moments when you're like, I don't, how can I do this? I'm not making any money. It's like, you know, this is insane. Um, and, and I just kept having role models that would like hit me. And so one day as I was making those dolls, I, I even had this as a weird side thing because basically a friend of mine was doing a show about Joni Mitchell who's like right up there on the top. And he was like, do you have any art about Joni Mitchell? And I was, said, no. <laughs> and then I went to my studio and I made this doll of Joni Mitchell. And I had so much like joy in crafting her face, even though it was like this strange, creepy doll. And I was so in love with it that that's kind of what led me to think like, I just, I feel like I need to see more of my heroes right now. And it could be because I had spent so much time with these like political almost all except Margaret Thatcher, male leaders that were so complicated and difficult for me to process that I just felt this need to kind of stare at the faces of women who had inspired me. So this is a conglomeration of women across a lot of different fields, art, music, film. There's Mar Maya, Maya Darren, Bjork, MIA. Oh, let's see, just a lot of different artists, PJ Harvey. Patty Smith, artists that I actually know that are obscure, like my friend Eva Las Vegas, um, Joan Jonas, Lori Anderson, Yoko Ono. Anyway, so um, that's this. This project was called the Star Seeds, um, and I also did a video where I performed in a in costume in front of them with um, some of my my own songs. And this is video from that the project with um, the. Uh, future clown in the desert. This was also a, a woman who I was so fascinated by in New York named Amazing Amy. And she would just come to all of my shows um, and do contortion. Like I'd be performing and she would just be doing contortion, like on stage. And it was so cool. And I was just like, okay, I don't know how you <laughs> found every performance I'm doing, but so I, I became fascinated with her. And so again, I feel like this shamanic clown character. I feel like sometimes I gravitate towards and attract the clown people in this world who I definitely feel like, uh, you know, make life worth living. I just love people like that, um, you know, and are often underappreciated people. And then this was a funny thing, just a, a, my very first thing that I ever did with Future Clown was um, performed Stairway to Heaven at a guitar center. And um, 
it was just so weird. Um, I was invited to do a performance at UC San Diego. And I don't know why. It just I was like, is there a guitar center near San Diego? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, there's one nearby. Because I'm always tortured by guitar center as a musician. You go in for like one. I never want to go there. It's like Kmart or Target, but of music gear. And, and it's like the only place oh, that I have to go to guitar center. And, and it's just always this weird attitude there. And um, so I went in, and I um, it was part of this, you know, they, they were sort of curating a show that was about um, people's, like, interacting with the space of the gallery, the museum. So I said, well, what if I, like, beamed in, like, live streamed something that was happening out in the city? And UC San Diego actually also has a middle school. So I said, I'm going to, like, get the middle school music teacher to teach all these kids Stairway to Heaven, can we like do that? And I wrote to her and she was like, sure. And then like, let's all go to Guitar Center. And suddenly everybody pull out guitars, like plug them in and just start playing Stairway. And I'll jump on the mic and I, and I did Stairway. So that was my piece. But you know, also for me, it was like a performance just for the people at the Guitar Center and also the people in this live streamed gallery, which I, I really like when you can really create a weird destabilizing live stream situation. It, it's, it's fascinating when that can happen. Um, not, not often that that happens. Not I'm not too good at this whole thing this way. Let me keep going. Um, yeah, anyway, this was also how the Star Seeds project was displayed. Um, that's MIA. That is um, Anna Mendieta, Marina Abramovich, and Etta James and Bjork and um, Louise Bourgeois. And then this is, you know, another a still from a video that I that I made. Again, I actually see this character in um, a kind of morphing over time, another kind of shaman figure. And I would just see these white bikes around the city and these were places where people had been killed in a bike accident. And somehow I felt this like drawn to just like do a sort of ritual and just honor like with a human presence, with like my presence, this moment of death that um, just punctuates the city. And um, okay, so I guess this harkens back to one of my earliest projects, um, which is, this is UCLA. I was an undergrad and Rebecca was my teacher. And um, I was obsessed with this idea of being sort of part of the architecture of the world and being a kind of like quasi alien figure. And that's why it's really weird to go like this because I see that I've never really lost that obsession and I just realized that right now. But this sense of like you go through the landscape and I used to ride a motorcycle and I would have this white helmet and, um, and I really had feelings sometimes on my motorcycle that were, I mean, I know this sounds like I might have an obsession with suicide, but it's like, I would genuinely feel like if I died now, fine. I'm like so in this moment of like just awesome power, like everything is just like life. I'm here in this little space for this moment and just this window of um, like to me, riding a motorcycle often was just, just so dangerous it, and especially in LA. And yet that danger is really coupled with like an exhilaration that you know you get when you're kind of a daredevil. So. I kind of was doing these different performances in different places in the landscape, but to me the performances were about kind of the human condition and just being, allowing oneself to be in this, I'll, I'll go back to the other piece in a second, but so I made a 16 millimeter film um, and this was a piece that I did in the sculpture department um, and I can't seem to zoom in, but okay. Basically I made these sculptures that, um, that were, steel and each sculpture um, reflected sort of the character of one or another performer. One was a motorcycle racer, the other was an acrobat, and the other was a, um, a swimmer. And he would constantly get up onto this platform. So um, I'm gonna fly through it because I see that we're running low on time. But um, so, you know, I kind of had a, a constant desire to place the figure in a landscape in a kind of abstracted way and thinking about what the feeling was being on a motorcycle. I would just engage in all kinds of different scenarios. And one of the like final culminations of this piece was that I, 
I scaled a, um, the actual art building, which was um, eight stories, and it was part of UCLA's, um, now the building has been destroyed, but this was, oh, and then this was also, I'll show you a little bit of that video. This was, a, again, I did this in New York where I scaled down a building. Um, and so this was the UCLA art building. Um, yeah, so it just was a kind of like figure on the landscape uh, that I was constantly exploring. And also just the, the strangeness of how quickly you become a superhero, quasi alien, with nothing but a white helmet and a white bodysuit and white shoes. Like, I don't know, somehow for me that was also really empowering, just that that's all it takes to do anything. Um, and this was a show that I did a few years back in Latvia, Riga, Latvia, and it was basically kind of a collage. The show itself felt like a collage of just different pe pieces of my practice and things that had influenced me over the years. So these were um, collages that I made, but actually I just set up a large wall and I included also figures from the ambassadors. Um, and the curator, you know, I think it's sometimes really great to let a curator you know, it depends on where you're at with your work and your life, but I was at a point where I was like, all right, here's my world, you decide. I don't, you know, I don't know what you want in this show. And so she was like, well, I can see you have like an obsession with dolls. So let's call this show Listening Dolls. And I was really intrigued by that because a big part of my practice that I haven't yet shown here is music. And um, so I just, you know, I felt really inspired to see how, um, how a curator positioned my work and reflected it back to me. Sometimes you're in your own head and you don't like have any perspective. So this I'll show just these images because if you're able to come tomorrow night, this was like my big, big magnus opus crazy project that took about eight years. And it's a rock opera musical. And it's about a true coincidence that I discovered um, two men, and this really is true, two men, both with the name Hamilton Fish, died on the same day. And I discovered this fact because their names were printed side by side in a newspaper from 1936. And it was one of those weird things where I had put that aside and it was like, that is insane. I just, I don't know why I even had this, but it was like a constant for me that every, every few months or so I would write a song about one of the characters in this you know, kind of ongoing journalistic weird story that I was just in researching, like who is this guy and who is that guy? One guy was actually a, a serial killer and the other guy was a statesman and the name Hamilton Fish comes directly from Alexander Hamilton whose best friend was a guy named Nicholas Fish, kind of an obscure political dynasty, but he named his um, first kid after um, him. So that's where the name Hamilton Fish came from. And this is a character who's a psychic medium, one of the first in the entire, uh, you know, ever to be known kind of, she was called Lenora Piper. So I kind of dug up all these characters from New York history. This was a scene shot at Sing Sing Prison, the actual prison where um, Albert Hamilton Fish, the killer, was executed. Yeah, and so um, I, I'm almost out of time here, but I would say um, I could show some videos and I can also say, I don't know if, Rebecca, does questions make sense or what would be the best way to kind of, like, okay, so, so then um, I'll just sort of figure out if I can do the scrolling and, yeah. Yeah, and I love to try to answer questions um, about, you know, being an artist, because I have to say, you know, I say this a lot, like when I was in art school, I just didn't see a, a template for, for what I was gonna do. And you know, I went to UCLA and there were these like very powerful art figures like John Baldessari and Charles Ray and people that you like kind of worshiped. And you know, it was like, oh, well, how do, how do I get to like do that? You know, so I find it, um, you know, if there's any thoughts about that, and not that I can answer them exactly, but I just find that that's really, um, a big overarching question that was in my head um, when I was a student. And so I can show you one of, oh, this is what I was gonna show you. I guess it's totally, it's gonna seem really out there in comparison to everything else, but because this is my newest project, 
I'll, I'll show it because sort of you see a lot of the other experimental work that I've done, but this piece here is actually a real documentary film and I worked with a, a team of people, I directed it, but it's going to a major film festival and I'm showing it to you as also a little bit of an example because another, um, I've had several friends that have gone to art school, MFAs, and gone off to become filmmakers. And a friend of mine directed the documentary about Lady Gaga that came out recently. And you know, it's just, for me, what's been really exciting is making this documentary has taken me into the film world. And I've found how that it's been really exciting to realize that I could make a documentary. And so this is a documentary about my parents' bookstore, which is called The Circus of Books. And if you're from LA, you might know it. And it's, um, it's a very well-known gay adult vi video and magazine store. But the funny twist and the weird backstory is that my parents are the very unlikely owners of this store. And their journey to get the store was a really fascinating one. So I'll show you a little bit. This is the trailer. It's something so important, it's right up there with the Parthenon. Circus of Books was more than just a bookstore. This was a place to form a culture that was potent, that was vibrant, and that had a big, hard dick. Circus of Books is embedded in the culture of the gay man in L.A. It had this whole section of that was just like porn, P-O-R-N, you know, it's great. There were not a lot of places you could get gay porn, so to see men naked and unafraid was pretty fabulous. It transcended race and class, and it was just about sex. Circus of Books was the essence of the sexual revolution. Do you have any idea who owns it? I don't know who owns it. I don't care. They must be wonderful people, I'll tell you that. Most people who own small business do it because they love it. And we did it by total accident. Karen and Barry were totally not what you would suspect to deal with pornography. <laughs> I don't think you should bring up the business at all. I never well, bring it I up. Only, but so I never talk to, about that. I only talk about the so gay employees. It's so hard to explain that business. Nobody how, asks. How do we get in it? My mom really doesn't like to tell anybody that she owns this store. In many ways, I think my mom does lead a double life. I've never even seen one of these movies. I can't imagine anyone watches five hours of this stuff, but maybe they do. Now porn is so accessible, like you just go to any website and you're not spending $100 on porn at the Circus of Books. <laughs> Sorry. My mother always said, whatever you do, don't say the name of the bookstore to anybody. If anyone asked, we were supposed to say our parents were in a bookstore, and later it was our parents are in real estate. It was just known that's how the family worked. You don't talk about the family business. You clock in, you do your business, you clock out, and you leave everything there. You don't bring it home. They're like a straight married couple, and gay porn is their, is their, their living. Get it. At one point, we were probably the biggest distributor of hardcore gay films in the United States. It was a very lucrative market, but you really took major chances. The FBI comes in, you know, like you see on television, with FBI on their jackets and their guns drawn. It easily could have been a five-year jail sentence, maybe more, and the fines could have been very, very large. They stayed strong through it all, and that was important. There was this whole crazy drama unfolding. Anyway, so that's, uh, yeah, a little taste of this film. And I'm, I'm showing it at the Tribeca Film Festival, which is exciting for me. And uh, it will very likely be on a major distribution platform. So when it's out, you can see it. Um, but the film that I, my previous film is a rock opera musical. And that toured in the independent weirdo art house and um, just kind of experimental film circuit. And I am doing a screening of it tomorrow night. So 
I feel like that's all I have time for on the performance side of my work, uh, but because there's that tomorrow, and I'll do a little performance after. So, cool. If you guys have questions, fire away. Oh. Thank you.